Cute. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, before we get started, make sure everyone mutes their um, microphones. It must be muted. All right, please do that now if you don't mind and do not unmute it uh, throughout the talk. If you want to ask a question, uh, feel free to uh, type it in there on the chat and we'll try our best to answer it, but please do not unmute your mic. I appreciate it. All right, well, thanks for joining me. And I hope tonight will be a really enlightening talk that um, you know, some healing, some understanding, but some, it's gonna be pretty hard. It's gonna be brutal. I mean, racism, systemic racism, general everyday run of the mill racism, it's hard. It's hard to deal with. And I think a lot of times people who haven't dealt with it will sometimes turn a blind eye to it. Or they'll think they're being compassionate about it, but they're really not. Uh, and then of course, there's a whole other group of people that just doesn't think it exists. And it does. Or they think they see something on TV that happens. The first question is, well, what did that person do to deserve it? And you get that all the time. Um, probably one of the biggest and most egregious acts of that kind is the whole Trayvon Martin thing. You know, I know Trayvon Martin has sort of become a symbol on both sides, which is really kind of weird how both sides have used that as a symbol. One is a symbol of this is what could happen to you just for being black. And the other side is he deserved to die. And it's really that split down the middle. I mean, there's literally a whole contingent of people out there who think Trayvon Martin got what he deserved. When the, the basics of the case is, he was literally just walking home, just walking home. And I'm gonna tell you how things like that can happen. You know, uh, that's not a new, new unique case. It's kind of unique in that, you know, he ended up getting killed. But I'm gonna tell you how those kind of situations can arise just out of the blue. And he's, he's not unique. Um, I know they tended to, the first thing, wanted to, first thing they wanted to do is find out a little bit about Trayvon Martin. And the first thing they went to was, oh wow, he got suspended for smoking weed. And all of a sudden to that whole contingent of people that wanted to hate him, that literally became a, a, a validation of why he should have died. Like people don't smoke weed every day. Like white kids don't smoke weed every day. Yeah, I see a lot of hands going up out there. <laughs> I see a lot of hands going up, but they made it into this guy is just some absolute thug. You know why? He got kicked out of, he got suspended from school for a few days for smoking pot. And they just ran with that as if, yes, he's a thug. And yeah, you know, we 100% we, we believe what George Zimmerman said um, because this guy got kicked out of school for smoking weed. And you hear it all the time it all the time. That's not unique. I mean, it's been proven over and over again with studies throughout time that black kids in school get punished more harshly than white kids. They get expelled where a white kid might get slapped on the wrist. And those things like that just persist all the time. Then, of course, as you get older, it carries on to the legal system to where, you know, a black man is going to get sentenced significantly worse than a white man for the same crime. Just a fact of life, it's not my opinion. And uh, you know, every study has shown that. And everything sort of stems from what people like to call white supremacy. White supremacy. What is white supremacy? It's literally just the white lie. You know, I mean, literally, that's what it is. You know, like 500 years ago, the Europeans essentially just created an inferior race so that they can enslave them and feel good about themselves. So turning black people into animals was, I'm not enslaving a human being. I'm enslaving an animal. And it's still 
those things just linger. That's, those are why those things are so insidious that they just carry on forever. And that's why you have to be diligent about snuffing them out. Now I'm gonna tell you, this is, this is unbelievable. With that same notion that black people are animals, what comes with it is they're now your beast of burden. They can stay out in the sun, 120 degrees weather, picking cotton because they're not humans, they're animals, they can do it. That work is nothing for them. You know, so they started these, these rumors that, oh wow, look how joyous the slaves are out there. They're singing in the fields, it's good. Well, of course they're singing to sort of get through everything, of course, get through the misery. But of course that was taken as, wow, those people can just, you know, they can just work all day long and they're just built for that. They're animals, that's what they can do. And here, in this millennium, as recently as a few years ago, med students, not just average run of the mill guy who barely got in college, we're talking about med students at the University of Virginia, a respectable university, one of the top schools in this country. Med students there believed or still believe, I should say, that black people have less pain receptors in their body. And therefore, once again, they can take more pain. So they're less likely to get prescribed uh, uh, pain medication. They're less likely to be listened to when they say they're in pain. And, and once again, this is not me just making this up out of the blue. You can literally Google it right now. University of Virginia, Med students believe black people have a higher pain threshold. Why? Because they have less pain sensors in their skin, things like that. So that's how that lie, that's how that lie from 500 years ago still persists. It's hard to get rid of those things. So the med students believe that. Just think of what Joe Jackass down the street believes. He thinks that he can do anything to you at any time and eh, they basically don't feel it. All right, so I'm gonna take you through some stories, some personal stories. And I know sometimes that when you hear stuff on TV, you hear someone in a telev television interview and are speaking about racism or some kind of brutality, it's always filtered, of course, because you're on TV, there's certain words you cannot say and certain emotions you cannot express. So you never really get the full feeling of what it is. And so tonight, I hope to bring you that full feeling of what it is to deal with it and what it is to sort of live like that in everyday life. So once again, I know I sent out um, a, a warning, so to speak, but I'll give it again. These stories are gonna be very authentic to what happened the language, the actions, everything. So if you have kids, you know, I don't know your kids and I don't know your kids' maturity level, so I'm not sure what they can handle and what they don't, but it's gonna be pretty brutal, pretty graphic. So I just wanna give that warning right now. Um, and I will, uh, maybe next week or next few days, have something that children can listen to because a lot of these lessons do need to be learned by children as well. And we'll sort of have a, a a more sanitized version of, uh, of these events so that uh, kids can listen to it. All right, so, so the first thing I remember about racism, um, which I didn't know was racism back then, was when uh, we were living in Germany, living in a military base, and uh, I'm in sixth grade, and we're talking about the Civil War. So the teacher asked, who won the Civil War? So I didn't really know much about the Civil War. You know, I said, North or South? Who won, North or South? So I processed it as, okay, we're from Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, Kentucky is in the South. That's where my family lives. Ergo, the South won. I had nothing to relate it to. So I said, the South. All the other kids in the class, they didn't know what, one way or the other as well. So they kind of just sat there like, you know, 50-50 chance that he's right. The teacher, however, 
went off. He just started laughing his ass off and just started just, I mean, he just lost it. He was like, oh, 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 oh yeah, the, the, uh, the, the South one, ha, 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 the South one. You know what? The South one, you'd be a slave right now. Come up here and clean my shoes, boy. Come up here and clean my shoes. You know, come up here and he just started, you know, naming off all these things. You know, come on, you're going to be my slave today. You're going to be my slave. And he just kept going off. He just wouldn't let it go. Now, I wasn't mad that he was calling me a slave and telling me to do things like that. Because once again, at that point, only thing I could relate slave to was kids playing a game. Oh, yeah, you know, if, uh, you know, if, if, if I hit this basket, you have to be my slave for the next five minutes. Oh, okay. And then you tell, you know, okay, so I'm your slave now. What do I have to do? Okay, stand on one foot for a while. Okay, you know, scratch your head and jump in a circle. So, you know, that's what slave was to us. It was just a game that people played, um, you know, if you lost a bet or something. So, so him doing that to me, you know, I was mad. I had tears, tears in my eyes and everything. But I, once again, I wasn't mad because he was calling me a slave because like I said, slave wasn't a big thing to me at that point. Um, I was just mad that he was humiliating me in class. You know, he just kept on. Come up, come on, come on, come up, come up, clean my shoes, boy. Come up, clean my shoes. And he started putting on this, this you know, big time uh, country accent. And he kept doing it, you know, and my eyes just started watering up more and more and more and more. So now you're in that dilemma of I'm humiliated, I'm mad, and now I'm crying. And now I feel like not a boy because I'm crying and boys aren't supposed to cry. So you have all these mixed emotions, you know, you can feel them just boiling inside of you. Um, and so we're on the playground later on. And of course, kids don't know any different. So it's like, hey boy, you're still my slave. And of course, you know, had like three or four fights out there. And, and uh, next thing you know, I'm the one who gets in trouble, of course, because now I got into a fight, now I'm in trouble. Now. Luckily, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, I didn't get expelled or get suspended or anything like that, but it went unchallenged. You know, we told our principal, Dr. Murray, and he sort of just, oh, well, he didn't mean anything by it. He's just making a joke, just, you know, and that was it. That was literally it. So that event's over. Uh, about a year, probably about a year later, Roots comes out. For those who've, who have never seen Roots, uh, it's a story about slavery, about a family sort of trek uh, through enslavement. And uh, Roots comes out and we're in there watching the movie. Now, that's the first time I got a grasp of what slavery was. That was my first grasp. It was, we were, we're sitting here, we had to go watch it as a school. They took us to the local theater and we had to watch it uh, as a class. Well, all the classes were in there. And every time something happened on the screen, you know, something brutal that happened to one of the slaves, you know, the white kids would always turn around and go, you know, they kind of look at you like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And, um, you know, so that was the first time I had really experienced what slavery was. You know, you see the crack of the whip and you see the dark skin splitting open and the red blood coming out. And of course, this is just dramatized. This is, this is a movie, but still the impact of the movie and seeing, once again, seeing those, the big cuts on the dark skin and the blood coming out, you have the red, you know, against the black and it just hits you, you know, and that's sort of where that emotion finally starts to swell. Like, oh, so Mr. Jackson thinks I'm his slave, huh? Oh, so that's what he thinks of me. And uh, so that's my, my first sort of foray into, okay, I just got abused. You know, that was a racial incident. I just got abused. So we have, I'm the youngest of five. So I have four older brothers. So as my brothers got older, the stories of racism started to trickle in little by little. Now we had some when I was younger as well. I remember them somewhat. Um, I remember, you know, the, the general, general times but I don't remember specifics of them because I was so young. You know, we lived in Fort Benning, Georgia. And, uh, you know, as we walk in, my father and his five children, the, uh, the person who owns the shop asked what we were. My dad was kind of like, 
what do you mean? What are we? I mean, you know, what are you? You know, what are you? Trying to find out what we were racially. Uh, my dad sort of looks, um, as sort of Middle Easternish, you know, like Omar Sharif or something. Well, Omar Sharif is probably an old reference a lot of you guys don't, don't know. But uh, he sort of looks like that, sort of Middle Eastern look. And then his kids were all sort of light. So the guy didn't, couldn't figure out what he was. So he wanted to figure out, you know, if you're something else, I'll cut your hair. But if you're black, you will not. So my dad, of course, said, yeah, we're black. And they wouldn't cut, cut our hair. Kicked us out, booted us out. My father's in the military, okay? My father's in the military. Kicked us out. He goes back and reports it to the base commander. The base commander, uh, when you do stuff like that, uh, they'll put a restriction on a place where no soldiers can go. No one on that base can go. So they put a restriction on that place. No one's allowed to go there anymore. And it was out of business in like a month or two. Um, but that's little by little how, how I started to realize how different we were. It's not, that we, it's not that we weren't white, it's that we were black. You know, everyone else could sort of nudge themselves over to whiteness. We were black. And uh, so things like that start to happen. Um, we're in uh, Butte, Montana. And we're going to our new base. Uh, we're going to in uh, Seattle and, or Tacoma. We're going to Fort Lewis. And we stop at a restaurant, broad daylight, once again, my father's in the military, broad daylight. We walk up to the store. I walk up to the restaurant, I should say, open sign. Everyone's in there, packed house. We walk up there. They change the sign to closed, lock the door, and won't let us in. My dad fought in Vietnam. Came back here and couldn't get served. This, this restaurant is packed. Everyone's in there. Oh, we're closed. Are you? Close for us, of course. Close for us. So it's these stories like this that really get Black Americans pissed off when you see these white guys all the time are giving these rah rah military speeches like, you know, military, you know, it's military or nothing. You know, Drew Brees, my, my, my grandfather's fought in, this, you know, in World War II. Fuck you. My grandfather fought in World War II, too. Big difference is your grandfather didn't want to associate with my grandfather over there. So my grandfather had to stay in separate barracks. And then when we got back to the US, your grandfather spit on my grandfather and told my grandfather, you guys have to live here. You guys can't eat here. You guys can't do anything else. Yeah, 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 yeah. You just fought for our country. You just put your life on the line. You just shed blood. But Coming back to the US, you have no rights. So, so these are the stories and, and the, the, the feelings and the emotions that are passed down for us. Drew Brees has it passed down. Like I had this glorious white grandfather who fought in the war and he came back and got celebrated. And you know, he was over there fighting the Nazis and you know, yeah, you guys fought the Nazis and we came back here and fought more Nazis, American Nazis, you know? So that was the big difference there. So that's what makes black Americans so angry when people throw that patriotic bullshit out there all the time. Our families were just as patriotic. We just got treated differently when we came back. So that's, that, that's the major difference. So that's why everyone erupted on Drew Brees that after four years of the Kaepernick uh, uh, protests, that he still has that shallow-minded Mickey Mouse bullshit about, oh, you're disrespecting the flag. No, Kaepernick started, stated over and over and over again, he's protesting the treatment of blacks here in America. How people kept trying to spin that into something military related. But once again, it goes back to people thinking that only white people fought in the war. Every World War II movie you see, Glorious white guy. Every Vietnam movie you see, glorious white guys. There's five or six stories that come out every year, uh, five or six movies that come out every year about World War II or Vietnam. And why? 
because each one of those stories are different. But every time, each year that a black movie comes out that's touching on something racial or historic, what's the first thing everyone says? Oh God, do we have to do that again? Why can't they just let it go? What? <sighs> Another story about, oh my God. Because somehow we don't have different stories according to other people. We're all lumped into doing the same thing. But the white stories, they're all different. This guy was heroic in this way. This guy was heroic in that way. This guy jumped on a grenade. This guy blew up a bridge. Everything's different. So that's why this, this, this hero line comes in of, all oh, our grandparents were heroes. What the hell were your grandparents doing at that time? That's where all this stuff starts. And once again, it's from that, from that original lie. So as we get older, so we're living in Fort Knox, Kentucky. Excuse me, let me go back to Germany again. So we're in Germany. No, no, sorry, Fort Knox before Germany. We lived in Fort Knox twice. Okay, so we're living in Fort Knox. All of a sudden, busing starts. And so for people out here who are too young to remember, busing is literally uh, these laws that were passed that allowed black children to go to better schools in mostly white areas because that's where the funding was and that's where the better schools were. So kids just wanted to go to school, just wanted to go to, to, go to, go to better schools. That turned into the most brutal, racist crap you've ever seen. Now we're talking about kids that just wanted to go to school. So we got caught in one of those rallies one day. We were leaving Fort Knox to go to Louisville to visit family members. It's about, well, back then there was no expressway. So it used to be about an hour. We had to go straight shot down Dixie Highway, down Dixie Highway. So we're going down Dixie Highway and they're having some anti-busing rally out there. And it's, you know, honk if you're against busing. And of course, everybody's honking their horns. And of course, every time something, every time some civil rights movement pushes forward, the first thing that comes out are all the Confederate flags. That's, that's just what it does. Every time there's some kind of significant movement um, of racial equality, you get swarmed by all of a sudden the Confederate movement. So we're driving down the street and there's just Confederate flags all over the place. And there's, there's you know, people going crazy and yelling and screaming and shouting. And here we are, a black family right in the middle of it. We just happen to drive into it. And uh, of course, we didn't honk our horn because yeah, busing didn't really affect us because we went to school on military bases. But of course, we were, we were for busing because people wanted to go to better schools. So my father didn't honk his horn. So of course we got swarmed by this angry racist mob and um, you know, they, they damaged our car and they sort of just beat on the car, do all that stuff, you know, it's terrifying, of course. It's a terrifying, you're, you're, you're a black family in the middle of this white mob who, who literally hates you. They're not protesting, you know, they're not protesting, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna build a bridge here and it's, it's, you know, it's coming through my backyard, we're protesting that. They're literally protesting that people like us in that car want to go to school with people like them. So you can't mitigate that kind of hatred. You know, your skin is what it is. You're black. So there is no popping out of the car and go, hey, I'm not black. I'm with you. There's none of that. I mean, you are what you are at that point. Um, so, you know, that's terrifying as a kid, once again, because you don't know what's going on. You still can't comprehend that kind of hatred of people hating you just because the color of your skin. You can't, you, you, you just can't comprehend it. It's like, they hate us for what? We, we did what? So, you know, of course my parents being adults and being able to grasp that, of course, you know, that's something that's gonna stay with you for the rest of your life. Um, so that was sort of the, one of the first you know, violent, um, uh, you know, racial incidents that we dealt with. So now we're in Germany, we're living on a base in Germany, and this is, we're living on a different base now than Mr. Jackson who enlisted me as enslaved. Uh, so now we're on a different base now. So now we start hearing stories, now my brothers are older and they're in high school, now we're starting to hear different kinds of stories. And uh, you know, my brothers are all really sensational athletes, and two of my brothers are playing in a game one day, and one of my brothers gets called a nigger. 
right? They're in the stands. One of the military families, uh, uh, you know, when you, when you play um, a sport in Germany, especially back then when the Berlin Wall was still up and the Cold War was going on, there was a military base like every 30 miles. You know, there was military bases everywhere in Germany. So there was a lot of Americans. So whenever you played a basketball game or a football game, one base would travel and play the other base. So it wasn't like you had a league within your little town or city. You went and played another base. So, but you're always on a military base. So my brother's in a military base and, and one of them gets called a nigger. So my one brother tells my other brother. And of course, you know, they go in the stands and they start raising hell. You know, they start raising all kinds of hell. I, you know, like I said, I have, I have a very, very athletic, very, you know, very, you know, big family. And uh, so they go up there and they start raising hell. They get into a fight up there. So the coach pulls them down and starts yelling at them. Starts yelling at them. And, you know, hey, you know, be better than them. You know, be the bigger man and forget what they're doing. And da 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 You keep hearing these little, you know, win one for the Gipper rah-rah bullshit speeches. And so, so my brothers, you know, they get taken off the floor, they get sent to the locker room. And then one of the coaches comes back there and once again, starts to get on my older brother. Hey, you know, don't ever do that again. And you need to show that you need to be better than that and all the kind of stuff. So my brother flips out and goes off on him and just cusses his ass out thoroughly, you know, because it's always, I'm the teenager and I'm getting in trouble because some adult called me a nigger and I fought back. Nothing happens to the adult, but I'm getting railroaded in here. And I just don't really have the kind of brothers that take that shit. They, they really don't. And we all respect authority, but none of us ever really feared it when we know we're right. And so, you know, so my brother's in there going off on him. And so we start to hear those kind of stories. Like, oh, wow, our, our you know, we are targets. Wherever we go, we are tar our, our black skin does make us targets. We are just, we are just naturally disliked, you know, all stemming from the old, the old white lie. We are just naturally mis uh, not liked. So, so my brothers are traveling one time, they're going through, I believe, Katerbach, Germany, and they make a stop there. Um, if, if, you, if you lived on a base that didn't have a high school, then you took a you took a bus to another base to go to high school there then you got a train ticket to let you travel all around europe because there was no activity bus that goes home at the end of the night you caught a train from one city to the next so my brothers are traveling i think they're still traveling as a team and they're going through katerbach germany and this is the 70s my brothers have these big froze you know and there's five of us so everyone always calls us the johnson five you know because we you know there's five of us there's five boys we're all just like right in a row. Uh, there was five of us in six years. So at some, you know, at one point we're one, two, four, five, and six, you know, so extrapolate that up. So my brother's in high school and they had these big froze and they're walking through this little German town. And that's when it starts to hit you that a lot of these people have never really seen a black person before. So they start coming up and sampling you like you're a specimen in a zoo. They really do. They start to come up and grab your hair and touch your hair. They want to feel it and it feels like black cotton and they're touching you and uh, so they're doing all this crap and they're literally feeling my brothers and some of the other black guys up. Just without permission, I'm touching you. I'm feeling you up now. Are you really a human? Then they kept feeling, they kept going to the back of my brothers. They kept going to the back. So, you know, if my brother's here, they just keep coming up the back. It's like, what the hell are you people doing? What the hell? You know what they're doing? They're checking to see if my brothers have fucking tails. Tails. You know why? Because back in the war, the white American GIs, American GIs, told all the European women that black men were animals and were devils and they literally had tails. That they're devils and they literally had tails. So if these white Europeans have no other way to, uh, uh, to verify it, it's what they've always been told. This is what the soldiers are telling them. 
This is what the soldiers are telling them about their other soldiers. You know what I mean? So why wouldn't they believe it? No one's going to tell something that heinous about someone who's supposedly their, their friend or their, their, their soldier mate, you know, their, you know, no one's going to say something like that. Right? So it has to be true. So these people grow up thinking that that shit is true. So they're literally filling my brothers up and some of the other black guys trying to find the tale. The seventies, not the twenties, thirties, forties, fifties bullshit. We're talking about the seventies. And once again, this is why people get so pissed off when, when people say, oh shit, you know, you know, slavery ended in 1865. You know, what are they doing? They've had plenty of time to pull themselves up by the bootstraps. No, you know, we've been basically marked for death since then. And so people have treated us like animals since then. Okay, so, so this is happening to my brother. So once again, these stories are starting to trickle down to us. And we're really starting to get the feeling like, wow, you know, are we the cursed people? Wow. I mean, it really starts to hit you as a kid. You start to feel that we're just not wanted anywhere in this world. So we get back to the U.S. My dad's still in the military. We go to Fort Knox. We live in Fort Knox. So we lived there for a year, and then he had this little transition period where he's going to be in the, he's going to be in the uh, military for about another four or five months. So by the time he got out, we would have to change schools from Fort Knox schools to go to school in Louisville. So he didn't want us to be able to change in the middle of the year. So we started schools in Louisville while he finished out his career in the military at Fort Knox. So Fort Knox is here. Louisville is here, and smack dab in the middle is Valley Station. So he figures we'll move to Valley Station because it's, it's uh, you know, close enough to Fort Knox and then close enough to Louisville schools. You know, he can drive home each night, everything. So we lived in Valley Station. This is 1982, if I'm not mistaken, 1982. I would have been a freshman... I, I, it was in the summer of I'm about to go to my freshman year of high school. So somewhere around 82. All right. So there's a lot of people on here tonight on this talk that are from Louisville. So I just said Valley Station. So I'm sure they're perking up in their seats right now like, oh, shit, what happened there? Okay. We don't know anything about Valley Station. We just know it's halfway between Louisville and Fort Knox. We've been there about a week. So my brother and I were going to play basketball. Uh, I was 13, he was 14. Uh, our, our, our house is here. Uh, this, this, there was a school, which is pro it was, uh, used to be Stewart High School, and now it's Stewart Middle School. Um, it was probably 100 yards away from our house, maybe, maybe a little more. So we leave the house, we walk across the street, we come to a, uh, a stoplight, we have to cross this street. And once we cross the street, the school is right there. Basketball courts out there, you know, just basic high school. So we're stopped at, so we're standing at the stoplight. My brother and I are just hanging out. All right, so we're just hanging out. Two kids with the basketball, talking, laughing, joking. And there's a car sitting there, uh, a pickup truck. So. It's just sitting there. We're not really paying attention to it. And we're talking, we're talking, we're talking. And then we realized that we've been here for quite a while. Like, well, it, it, you know, why is this car still stopped? We go across the street and we look up and like, wait a minute, they have a green light. We still have a red light. Why aren't they moving? So you start to get that little feeling like, oh shit. So we look you know, through the window, and it's, it's one of those scenes you only see in movies. You know, the stereotypical redneck that you would see in a, you know, in a movie about the backwoods, inbred people. You know, it, it's one of those scenes. So we're sitting there. So at this point, I still don't know about the Confederate flag. All right, 
I always had a trouble distinguishing when you're young, had trouble distinguishing between the British flag and the Confederate flag. They look, they're very similar. And so, you know, I knew a lot of rock stars had, you know, British flags and, you know, my brother and I are really big rock and roll fans. So a lot of our bands had uh, Confederate flags, not Confederate flags, British flags. We just sort of all saw that as the same, Confederate, British, you know, and uh, never, never thought of that one was a symbol of hate and one was just British. So we're standing there and uh, all of a sudden we start hearing, God damn niggers. God damn niggers. God damn fucking niggers. So we're standing like, ah, uh, shit, what do we do? So we just walk around the truck and continue on to go over there to play basketball. So the truck pulls up behind us. Remember, we're 13 and 14 years old. So the truck pulls up behind us and Hold on one second, let me adjust this a little bit. Okay. All right, so, so the truck pulls up behind us, and once again, you just get that eerie feeling, you're walking to play basketball, and this truck is following you slowly. So it pulls in front of us, and they stop us. So we're here. The street that we just passed is probably 20 yards away, maybe. You know, it wasn't like we were in some remote area, and they had us cornered somewhere. We're right by a busy street, which would be Valley Station Road. And they get out of the car. And these are adults, There's three adults. They get out of the car, shotguns. They put the shotguns up to our head. They put the shotguns up to our head. They start calling us niggers and doing all that kind of stuff. Hey, you're a fucking nigger, aren't you? You're a nigger, aren't you? And they're literally asking that question. You're a fucking nigger, aren't you? Huh? Say you're a nigger. You're a fucking nigger, aren't you? So we're both just standing there, frozen. And really, you know, we literally have a shotgun pressed against your temple. So it's different than just seeing a gun somewhere. It's different than seeing a gun on TV. It's different than seeing a gun at your house. It's pointed up to your head and you have nothing but rage coming out of the person who's holding that gun. So you don't know how that's gonna turn out. So he starts just going off on us, you know, you're a fucking nigger, aren't you? Call yourself a nigger. Call yourself a nigger. I'm a nigger. Goddamn right, say it louder. I'm a nigger. You're goddamn right, you fuck. Now call him a nigger. Call each other niggers. So, you know, this goes on for, I mean, it could have been 30 seconds. I don't know. Seemed like it was, you know, four hours, of course. And he's just going off on us. You know, call yourselves a nigger. We don't want you fucking monkeys out here. God damn it. Fucking neighborhood like this. Now we got to have all these fucking monkeys out here. You're a fucking monkey, aren't you? You're a fucking monkey, aren't you? Uh, yeah, man. We're, yeah, we're monkeys. You, know, you, know, you want me to say you got a fucking shot, like a shotgun against my head? Yeah, we're, we're, we're fucking monkeys. God damn right, you're a fucking monkey. Dance around like a monkey. Act like, act like a monkey. Act like a fucking monkey, nigger. Act like a fucking monkey. What do you mean? Act like a fucking monkey. Ooh, ooh, ah, ah, ah. Ooh, ooh, ah, ah, ah. Ooh, ooh, ah, ah. God damn right, you're a fucking monkey, nigger. Ooh, ooh, ah, ah, ah. Ooh, ooh. We're 13, 14 years old. What the fuck do you think that does to a kid? What in the hell do you think that will do to someone? We're on the side of the road acting like fucking monkeys. People are passing by. They're driving by. Once again, we weren't in some remote spot somewhere. No one gave a damn. Drive by, some people slow down, of course, like, oh, wow. Got a shotgun against these kids' head. Have a nice day. It's gone. So we're standing on the side of the road. Just, you know, 
walking, you know, like, you know, literally calling each other niggers and we're, 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 you know, walking around like monkeys and shit. It's my, it's my brother, Steve and me. And, uh, and, you know, at that point, you literally think you're going to die because, I mean, where do you go for there? You know, these people aren't going to let us go. They just, you know, they're on the side of the road. Uh, we can identify them in general. Um, you know, they have to kill us, of course. So they go on with that for a little while longer, you know, make us dunk, dance around like monkeys and all that kind of shit. So it sort of ends as quickly as it begins with, we're going to be watching you fucking niggers, okay? We don't want y'all out here. We're going to be watching you fucking niggers. And they pack it up. And then one of them gets back out and he has this Confederate flag tattoo on his arm. He's like, kiss this flag, nigger. Kiss this flag, nigger. So he's got this sweaty ass, hairy arm, with, you know, with a tattoo on it. And he's literally just, you know, coming up to us. Kiss this flag, nigger. Kiss this flag, nigger. This flag owns you, nigger. This flag owns you. You remember that. You remember that. We'll always own you. We'll always own you. Kiss the flag, nigger. I remember kissing this guy's sweaty, racist, piece of shit, redneck arm. We're 13 and 14. We're 13 and 14. There's a police officer to live right down the street. This guy threatened us, you know, we're going to kill you. We're going to kill your family if you guys don't get out of here, blah, blah, blah. So we go to the house down the street. It's a police officer owns. We knock on his door because we know he's a police officer. We tell him the story, and he's kind of standing there like, they, they didn't mean anything by it. They, they didn't just, you know, just, they, they, they didn't mean anything by it. Just, they're not going to kill you. Just, they're, I hear what you're saying, but they're not going to kill you. They're just trying to scare you. Well, God damn it, we're scared. It worked. But once again, no, he had no desire at all to pursue it. But of course, he's probably thinking the same thing. God damn right. We don't want you out here either. So, School starts, and we're in school one day, and, uh, well, let me back up slightly. One day we wake up, we're about to go to school, and everyone's garbage is in our yard. So everyone in the whole neighborhood took their garbage and emptied it into our yard. So our, our, gar our yard is just full of the neighborhood garbage. And, uh, you know, so I start to, start to be scared because my mother was home a lot by herself. Once again, my dad was still at Fort Knox, and then we're all in school. My oldest brothers were gone off to college, um, and the next three brothers, we were all in school all day, so my mom's usually there by herself. So you're, you know, you're scared of that. We didn't tell her about the shotgun incident because we didn't want to scare her. And, you know, I, I, I felt bad about telling anyone because once again, as a boy, you start to feel like less than a boy. Like, why didn't I do something about it? So then you have that guilt trip of, I let this person make me call myself a nigger. I made this, I allowed this person, I allowed this person to make me dance around like a monkey on the side of the road. And I did nothing about it. So then that fucks with your psyche, of course. That whole thing. So, so after the garbage incident, we're at school and they come to our class one day and they're like rushing us out of there. They're like, you know, they got me out of my class, they got my, my brother out of his class, I guess a couple of the black students. They come get us out of class and they rush us home. So once again, the school is here, our house is here, maybe 100, 150 yards separates it, but Valley Station Road run right, run, runs right in between it. So, they're gonna have a Klan rally. They're gonna have a Klan march coming down, uh, uh, down Valley Station Road. 
So they wanted to get us out of school early so that we could cross the road before that march started. So, you know, we cross the road, we get home, we see the parade go by, and you can see KKK shit on TV till the cows come home, until you see it in person, until you see it in person, it's a different story. To 90% of the people in the world, the KKK costume is something you see on TV. That's what you're related to. It's just something you see on TV. Until you see it in person, it's a different story. It's a different story. So the FBI had to sit out in front of our house to make sure we got to school safely for the next couple of weeks. And then eventually we moved. We moved. Once my father got finished, we moved into Louisville and uh, we, were, we were done with Valley Station. But if you ask anyone, which, which is funny, we, we were, I'm on a text message uh, a group chat with a bunch of my friends from high school. And we were talking about something the other day, completely unrelated to Stewart. Like I said, Stewart High School is where we went to school. Completely unrelated. And one of my friends, Sean, pops on there and says, blah, 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 that's where Stewart was, fucking racist. That's what we all remember. You know, Stewart High School, Valley High School, Valley Station Road. Um, but, you know, Scott Sean was in middle school out at Valley, you know, out at uh, Stewart Middle School. They were throwing rocks and shit at the bus. You know, as the bus drove by, the bus drives away, they were throwing rocks and stuff at the bus and once again, yelling everything imaginable and a bunch of stuff unimaginable uh, at a bunch of kids. So that's what you end up remembering. So we move into Louisville and my friends and I were going to play basketball one day. No, I'm sorry. We were going to University of Louisville to watch those players play basketball at this little local gym they used to play in called Crawford, High, uh, Crawford Gym. So we're going down there, you know, and for those of you who don't know, Louisville is a spectacular basketball team. Rachel, relax for a second. She's a Kentucky fan. We'll let her slide. Um, so, so um, we're going. We're going to watch their team play. They're like on the verge of a, a you know, national championship. So we're just going down there to watch them play. So we 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 go down there. We watch them practice. We're on our way back. We're in Old Louisville, and once again, we're just walking down the street, and this Chevy Nova pulls up. Same thing. Niggers. Niggers. It always starts off real low. Niggers. Niggers. But this time we're a little bit older. We're the oldest. So we're like, hey, fuck you. You know, we're not children anymore. We're still theoretically kids. But we're like, yeah, fuck you. Fuck you, niggers. Yeah, fuck you. Fuck you, niggers. So they pull out guns and knives, and we haul ass. We haul ass. So here we are running through old Louisville with a bunch of rednecks chasing us in hot pursuit in this souped up Nova and no one would stop and help us. We were four black kids running. So obviously we were the ones that had done something. No one would help us. We're running down yelling, help, help, help. And these rednecks, we're cutting through grass. We're trying to cut through places that they can't cut through to get there. And no one, no one would help us at all. In fact, everyone's sort of like scared, like, oh shit, let me get away from there. And our whole thing was, we have to make it to Smoke Town. We have to make it to Smoke Town. My friend Andre lived there, him and his brothers, you know, a uh, uh, good deal of amount of black people around there. We can make the Smoke Town, we'll be safe. So we're just running our asses off running, you know, these people are chasing us, we're zigzagging, cutting through yards, jumping over fences and everything. These guys are just in hot pursuit. In hot pursuit. We get away, we make it to Smoke Town, and uh, you know, the, I, I think they saw the demographic change that we got a little closer to Smoke Town, and they turned around and drove away. All right. So they, those are major things. Those are major things that sort of, sort of screw up your psyche for a long time. 
Then we start learning the smaller, more undercover racist shit. Where people don't come out and say they're racist, they don't act racist, they just do racist things while simultaneously claiming that they're not racist. So <laughs> I remember the big thing, and once again, I don't know where everyone learns the same thing from, but the big thing in high school always was, my parents hate black people because a black man raped my aunt. And it was always the same story. It was never their sister, it was never anyone like that, where someone that we could check, someone that might go to high school with us. It was always an aunt or a cousin or anything. But they all had the same story as a justification of why their parents don't like black people. Now, at the same time, these people claim that their parents aren't racist. And no one wants to admit their parents are racist, of course, or, or whatever, they're either racist or a murderer or a pedophile. No one wants to admit it. So these kids who are friends of ours and you know, nice, nice people, but they all have that same story of, well, it's just because, well, it's just because, and it's just because, and it's just because, all same story. My aunt was raped by a black man. And of course our natural question was, and what if she got raped by a white man? Would you no longer like white people? I mean, what's your, what's the story here? But it's a story they learned, and I think the kids learned it. When I say kids, I mean, you know, our high school uh, classmates. I think they learned it because, once again, it gave them a sense of solace of, my parents aren't racist. They really do have a legitimate reason for not liking black people. And it gave them just sort of that, that sense of comfort of, you know, you know my, my, my parents aren't that redneck that chased you in the car and calling you nigger. That's not my parents. But they all had the same thing. But once again, we always realized that whatever we did as black kids, it was viewed and judged more harshly. Simple things. I, I was on the homecoming court uh, one time during basketball season. Uh, we lived out in the suburbs. Our school was in town. So, you know, we're going to the basketball game that night. And I don't have a ticket. I forgot my ticket at home. Now, I'm not going to drive way back out to the suburbs to get my ticket. All right. I'm on the homecoming court. I'm dressed for the homecoming court. I walk in. And the athletic director comes up and says, you can't come in. You don't have a ticket. I was like, I'll, I'll bring you my, you know, I'll bring you my ticket Monday. You know, I have one. I mean, they issued me one because uh, you're on the homecoming court. Well, you don't have it with you. I'm like, you need to go home and get it. I'm not going to drive way back out to Westport Road to get this, get, get my ticket. I'm not. Just, just let me in. No. So it turns into a big, big, huge ordeal. So my friend Kevin, who's on here tonight, his mother, Miss Wigginton, she's the one that sort of jumped up and calmed everything down because this was about to get physical. He was approaching me like he was going to get physical with me. He's about to get physical. Miss Wigginton jumps up, stops it you know, puts an end to it. I'm just fuming. I'm just absolutely fuming over something this simple. You know, I have a ticket. I'm one of the star athletes at your school. I'm one of your star athletes at your school. I'm not trying to sneak into this game. That would not have happened to one of the white star athletes at the school. It just wouldn't. It just wouldn't. So, when I think about football, and I think about high school football, I'm just gonna get, I'm just, gonna get just a little bit footballish on, footballish on you right now. Now, they had a poll the other day, like, who are the top four quarterbacks in the NFL? They're like, Patrick Mahomes. 
black. Lamar Jackson, black. Deshaun Watson, black. Dak Prescott, black. That's phenomenal. That is phenomenal, and I'll tell you why. This is how quickly we forget shit. This is how quickly we forget. Now remember, I was in high school in the 80s. Not 30s, not 40s. I was in high school in the 80s. MTV, Madonna, Michael Jackson, 80s. They would not let black guys play quarterback. People take it for granted now. They would not let black guys play quarterback. We had two phenomenal quarterbacks on our team. Well, would have been quarterback. My brother, Steve, phenomenal quarterback. Another one of our friends, Chris Phelps. Phenomenal quarterback. We come out to practice. We come out to tryouts at the beginning of, uh, at the, beginning of the year. And it's like, okay, you know, quarterbacks over here, receivers over here, running backs over here, blah, 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 blah. My brother Steve goes into the quarterback line. He's been playing quarterback all his life. He's never played any other position. He's been playing quarterback all his life. And now we're in high school, and the coach is like, uh, we're going to need you in the wide receiver line. He's like, uh, no, I'm good. I'm, I'm a quarterback. Uh, no, I'm gonna, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna put you at receiver. It's like, no, I'm, I'm a quarterback. I've been, I've been playing quarterback all my life. I am a quarterback. They would not allow the black guy to play quarterback. Why? Black guys are too stupid. They couldn't play quarterback and they couldn't play middle linebacker on defense. Why? Because middle linebacker has to be smart. And who's smart? White guys. Who's dumb as fuck? Black guys. Can't play quarterback, can't play middle linebacker. So my brother, who is a spectacular quarterback, and smart, and intelligent, he's black. You can't play quarterback. Literally. So we had these quarterbacks over here who were I don't want to say anything bad about anyone, but compared to my brother and compared to Chris, they were awful. Now I'm talking about two, my brother, Steve, and my, uh, uh, our friend Chris, I'm talking about two top flight, top level athletes, not just, oh, he's pretty good. For, I'm talking about like world-class, top of the line athletes. We're not letting them play quarterback. So we end up putting this guy out there who's a dud. We probably won state championship after state championship. Our, our, the rest of our team was so good. We had no quarterback whatsoever. Now, my brother probably regrets this to this day. I don't know. But my brother got pissed off and left and quit. If I can't play quarterback. I'm not playing anything, and which, which, which is really a shame because, I mean, you know, I made it to the NFL. He would have made it to the NFL with ease. He was bigger, faster, quicker, blah, blah, blah. I could jump higher. Now, but he, you know, he would have made it to the NFL as well. But his, his, his career ended right there. He couldn't let him play quarterback. He's like, fuck it, I'm out. It's kind of hard to tell someone who's been doing something their whole life that they can't do it. Not, not that he tried out for it and got beat out. You can't even try out for it. You can't even get in the competition. You can't try out for it. So before we even get on the field, before we even pick up a football, you cannot try out for this. So he left. He left. I may have done the same. They weren't Blackballing my position, I was playing receiver and running back and defensive back, so black guys were allowed to play that. But if they told me I couldn't have played that, I probably would have quit too. You know, so I don't blame them, but you know, luckily, just by luck of the draw, I wasn't in one of those positions. And I think that's what people tend to forget now. We see black quarterbacks now, and 
I, I believe we have some, uh, one of my friends, uh, Stacy, who uh, we've been friends forever. We met in Atlanta when I first moved in here. Her daughter goes to Clemson now. And, uh, you know, so hopefully her and some of her friends are watching. And the, the, the theory, I mean, even though you guys have Trevor Lawrence there, but the theory of a black quarterback is not shocking to these kids in high school or college right now. My story is shocking to them, but the theory of having a black quarterback is not shocking to them. They're probably thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, we see black quarterbacks all the time. They would not let us play. Look at me. I'm not a senior citizen. It wasn't like it was, you know, 80, 90 years ago. Would not let us play. That's how insidious the white lie is, once again, that we're less intelligent. And this stuff just permeates everything. It permeates everything. Looking for a job, going to school, getting stopped by the police, everything. All right, so I leave high school. I'm being recruited by all these schools. My choices come down the end between uh, Louisville, Kentucky, Purdue, and Vanderbilt. So I end up choosing University of Kentucky, even though I'm a diehard Louisville Cardinal fan. They were sort of just in, yes, Rachel. Uh, they were sort of just, you know, Louisville at that time was sort of going through a transition period, didn't really know where they were going. I went to the University of Kentucky. So I had injured my shoulder a little bit before the season. So I was going to play in the Kentucky All-Star game and I didn't play in that game because my shoulder was still not healed properly. And it was the first, you know, inaugural Kentucky, sorry, Kentucky, Tennessee All-Star game. And it was played in Lexington at the University of Kentucky. So I'm there in my school to be. So the coaches come over to the field one day and they wonder why I'm not playing. I'm like, oh, you know, I've injured shoulder and just not ready to play yet. Now I'm really thin. Once again, stuff that people don't think about these days, but when I was in high school, we didn't have a weight program. Yeah, you know, we had just some, maybe one metal bar off in the corner somewhere. Uh, we didn't have weight rooms like these kids have now. So I'm railed thin, probably weigh about 160 pounds. And the coach looks at me, he's like, are you gonna be a football player or not? I was like, yeah, I'm not really sure what you mean. I'm like, well, you know, it doesn't look like you've been working out or doing anything. It's like, yeah, my shoulder's injured. Plus, I don't know what working out is. I know the general concept of working out, but it wasn't like back in the day there were LA fitnesses and 24 hour fitness on every corner. There, were, there wasn't fitness centers everywhere. That's a relatively, relatively modern thing. So there was no place for me to go work out. So I arrive on campus. Well, I was supposed to come to campus beforehand. Uh, it's supposed to set me up with a job. I'm supposed to come up there and work and get to know the team and blah, blah, blah. Well, they thought I was going to be a dud because, you know, I was a highly recruited, highly rated recruit, but all of a sudden I have this injured shoulder and I'm really thin. And so they just completely sort of like wiped me off. So I keep calling like, hey, am I coming up there for the summer, get a job and work out? And they're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It kept beating me around the bush. So school starts. I arrived there for school. Um, and all of a sudden I realized that like within the first week that they really don't like me. It was just weird and I couldn't figure out why. So my coach, my position coach, Joe Viadella, he comes up to me and says, hey, big man, I want you to cut your hair. And uh, I said, pardon me? He says, big man, I want you to cut your hair. Big man's the head coach. I said, okay, okay. 
Joe leaves, you know, Vi Coach Vidella leaves, and you know, business as usual. He comes up about two days later, hey, coach wants you to cut your hair. I was like, okay, same thing. He leaves, I don't cut my hair. Comes up another two days, hey, big man wants you to know if you're gonna cut your hair. I said, no, I'm not. Now, I'm gonna post a picture on my Instagram of what my hair looked like so you guys can get a full grasp of how not long it was. I'm, you, you, it's gonna blow you away. It's gonna blow you away. So, so he calls me to his office. He calls me to his office and he says, hey, I want you to cut your hair. I said, okay. He goes, okay, you're gonna cut it? I said, no, no, okay, I heard you. He said, are you gonna cut it? I said, no, I'm not gonna cut it. He goes, I'm telling you to cut your hair. I looked at him, I said, hey, you recruited me. You knew what I looked like. You came to my parents' house, you sat on our couch, and you recruited me. And you knew what I looked like. And once again, it's gonna blow your mind when you see the picture. Um, I said, you recruited me. So he said, are you gonna cut your hair? I said, no. He said, are you disobeying a direct order? I said, if that's what you're calling it, then, then yes. He goes, yes, what? I said, yes, I guess I'm disobeying your order. He said, no, yes, sir. I said, oh, no, 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 I'm not the, I'm not the sir type. I don't even call my dad, sir. You know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a yes, please, and no thank you type of person, but I'm not a sir and ma'am type of guy. You know, I, I will give you the utmost respect. I will always address you with a yes instead of a yeah, nah, nah. I'll always give you a yes and a no, and a yes please, and a no thank you. I'll do it every time. Just not a sir guy. He goes, you're gonna address me as sir. I said, nah, no I'm not. So he says, all right, let's get back to the hair. I'm gonna ask you one more time, you're gonna cut your hair. I said, no, there's white guys on the team with hair way longer than mine. Cam Jacobs, hair down here, Frank hair, hair. You know, these guys had hair. You're telling me to cut my hair. So then gives me an ultimatum. All right, you either cut your hair or you quit. I said, no, 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 no. Either I don't cut my hair and you kick me off. I'm not quitting. Now, if you want to kick me off for not cutting my hair, those are two different things rather than me quitting. Now, you're going to have to explain to people that you cut me off because I didn't cut my hair. And once again, I can't fully express how not long it was. It's a little bit, a little bit, a little bit more than it is now. A little bit more. I'm, I'm not joking. A little bit more, right up here now. And uh, so, so from that moment on, I said, no, no, no. If you release me from my scholarship and allow me to go play somewhere else, I'll leave. But. I'm not quitting. You're going to have to explain to people that you, you kicked me off for my hair. Not because I did anything wrong, not because I got into a fight, not because I drink, not because I smoke, not because anything like that. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I'm serious about my football. You know, I practice hard. I play hard. You're going to kick me off for my hair. After that, he literally didn't speak to me the rest of my college career, unless, unless it was me getting in trouble for something. Literally never spoke to me after that. And we just butted heads like you wouldn't believe because you know what happened next year? I redshirted my freshman year, but you know what happened next year? They put me on the field and I became a star. And so then it was like, fuck, damn, now I have to be, Guess I now have to be sort of cordial to this guy because now he's pretty damn good. Now I can't kick this guy off. He's so damn good. I'll just mess with him for the rest of his career, but I can't kick, can't kick the guy off. So we went back and forth, you know, for the rest of the years I was there, you know. You'll probably find, not find many players more hated than I was. Simply stemming, stemming from that. So we're playing Ole Miss one year. 
Ole Mississippi, Ole Miss. This was still back then when they were allowed to fly, fly the Confederate flag in everywhere. So we walk in to Ole Miss Stadium, and there's just Confederate flags everywhere. Everyone in the stands is waving Confederate flags. I'm like, what the fuck? Are you serious? Just stunning. Stunning. So just like every other game, there's fans kind of close to the field, and they're talking, and we're talking back. They're talking, we're talking back. It's, you see it everywhere, especially, especially with football teams. They're going to talk a little shit. We're going to talk a little shit. So we're going back and forth with the fans. So as we're walking in, so let me back up a little bit. By this time, I did have long hair. After I knew I was good and I couldn't get kicked off because I was so damn good, I did grow my hair long. So I'll put that picture up there as well. Um, and uh, so now, so, so we're, we're arguing with these fans at uh, Ole Miss. And all of a sudden, of course, if, you, if, you're, if you're yelling at black players and you got Confederate flags, sooner or later, you're going to hear nigger. So all of a sudden, it was like, hey, fuck you, you long-haired nigger. Fuck you, you long-haired nigger. We're going to do this. When the game starts, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. Blah, blah, blah. You know, he's just kind of going off. It's football. You know, by this time, you know, I'm pretty much a man. So he's, he's talking shit. And I'm talking shit right back. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You keep talking that shit. As soon as we step on this field, we're about to bust their ass. We're just, you know, we're just doing that shit talking back and forth. All right, yeah, you long-haired nigger. They're going to do this. They're going to do that shit. And I was like, oh, fuck you, redneck. Fuck you. The coach comes and grabs me as I'm walking into the locker room, grabs me by the back of my shoulders, pulls me back, and I turn around. He goes, hey, hey, show some class. Show some class, young man. And I'm telling you, I went from zero to 100 degrees in like a half a second. It was just one of those things that you sort of snap. You just get finished calling, you know, this person just calling you everything in the book, nigger, 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 nigger. I say, go fuck yourself, redneck, which is, you know, just basic banter back and forth. He snatches me, sticks his finger in my face, and tells me to show some class. And I just lost it. Show some class to who? This fucking redneck right here, are you fucking serious? You know, a couple of players grabbed me and pulled me back. I was like, no, get off me. Fuck that shit. I'm tired of this shit. We can call niggas every fucking day. And all you gotta do is sit here and say, oh, be the bigger man, bigger, bigger, you know. So I'm thinking about these, these conversations also. Like I was telling a story uh, earlier about my brothers, about the fight they got in at the basketball game. Hey, you, you know, you just be the bigger man and, you know, don't, don't worry about it and all that kind of shit. I start to realize that was the standard reply. Every time something happened on campus, that was always the standard comeback. Oh, just be the bigger man. Oh, don't worry about it. Oh, yeah. Oh, so I, I got to let this dude stand in my face and call me nigger every day. And you, you're just telling me just, oh, I, I'm the bigger man. Bye. That's what you're telling me to do? So we're in the middle of football, you know, about to play a football game. Ferrari hyped up and jacked up anyways. And he said that to me. Like I said, and I just fucking lost it. You know, Fuck you. God damn it, this guy's calling me a nigger. You think I'm gonna sit here and take this shit? Are you out of your fucking mind? Are you out of your fucking mind if he says it again? And, you know, so once again, these players are pulling me back by now, and I'm just, you know, I'm just off the charts. I'm just off the charts. He's like, hey, all I'm saying is, you know, don't stoop to their level. I was like, no, no, I'm gonna stoop to their level. I'm gonna stoop to their level. We're about to play a football game. I don't have to, because I'm a football player, I'm not obligated to take that shit. I know people think that athletes have to take anything you throw at them because I bought a ticket. I can say whatever I want to. That stupid ass Paul Feinbaum shit. Hey, once a player, you know, once a fan buys his, his ticket, he can say whatever he wants. So you got some guy standing three or four feet from you, calling you a nigger left and right, and I call him a redneck. I'm the bad guy. I'm the bad guy. Lost it. Just completely, completely lost it. You know, I said my teammates had to drag me away, and I'm just, you know, I, I'm, I'm just, just, just furious. Because it's not the first time we told them that someone called us a nigger on campus. Once again, it was always the same excuse. Oh, just, 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 just be the bigger man. Just be the bigger man. So I start to see that this, that's this pattern. They didn't care. They didn't care. The way, that, the way they saw it is, well, I mean, 
guess you are kind of one. I mean, you know, I mean, that's what you're processing it. You keep telling us that we're the ones that are wrong. So, okay, so that happens. So the game's over. He calls me to his office the next day and he asked me about it again. I'm a little bit calmer now, but I'm still defiant. He says, hey, son, all I'm saying, you can't go around fighting the world. I was like, I'm not fighting the world. I'm fighting that idiot that just called me a nigger. That's, that's what I'm doing. You don't give me these bullshit platitudes about be the bigger man and all this kind of crap. We're talking about real life here. We're talking about, it sounds easy for you to say that to me as a middle-aged white man, older white man. It's easy for you to say that because it's not going to happen to you. It's not going to happen to you. So you don't have to process that like, oh, should I fight back? Should I let it go? What should I do? You don't have to do that. So the next year, can you go those papers I have on my computer? Uh, so the next year, we're at school. There's this guy on campus named Happy Chandler. His name is Happy Chandler. He used to be the commissioner of baseball, Major League Baseball. And he was the governor of Kentucky. And by this time, he was just an old guy who was on the board of trustees. Now, once again, you guys are gonna have a hard time processing this shit because it's gonna almost seem comical right now. He's in a board of trustees meeting. He was on the board of trustees. He got appointed by the governor. In the middle of a board of trustees meeting, so this we're, we're talking about, we're talking about South Africa. You know, where they still had apartheid. We're talking about. You know, people are talking about divesting from South Africa and having this big meeting and, you know, everyone's pulling their money out of South Africa trying to dismantle apartheid. He stands up in the middle of a board of trustees meeting at a major university. You guys with me here? At a major university. And he says, this is from the newspaper. They're talking about taking the money out of South Africa and all this stuff. He says, in the middle of a meeting, you know, Zimbabwe is all niggers now. There aren't any whites. You know, Zimbabwe is all niggers now. There aren't any whites. Says this at a board of trustees meeting at a major university. You know what the ramifications were? Nothing. Nothing. So we complained. I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm not playing football for this university again until, until this guy's off the board. But he's such a beloved character in Kentucky. He sings my old Kentucky home at football, I mean, at basketball games. After the game, everyone locks arms. They sing my old Kentucky home. And this guy, He's beloved. The, the, the medical center on UK's campus is named after him. You know, Zimbabwe is all niggers now. There aren't any whites. Now, you can't imagine someone saying that these days without there being some kind of ramifications. But there wasn't. We tried to get him to apologize. We let a boycott. Myself and a guy named Chris Chenault. We let this big boycott. Now, Chris and I were going to do it ourselves. I didn't really want too many other people to buy, uh, to, to, to get into it. Cause I knew most people didn't really have the resolve that we had. A lot of people would give it lip service. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. But I knew they weren't going to have the resolve, resolve that Chris and I had. But you know, after a while we sort of let them join in like, okay, well, you know, yeah, you guys can join in this boycott. So they quickly co-opted it and so we did a march down to the, to the, to the uh, Capitol building, uh, to, to the courthouse. We did a march down there. We had our football crap on, blah, blah, blah. This guy still won't apologize at first. He holds a press conference at his house. He holds a press conference at his house. And they're asking him about this whole situation. It's a major, major news story, major. <laughs> It's, it's almost comical. All right. This is what he said at the press conference when defending himself. 
okay? He's saying this to reporters. He's not saying like off mic somewhere. He's saying this to reporters. He says, <laughs> he said, I did say it. I wish I hadn't. I know enough about what's going on in the world to know there's a lot of people who, if you call them nigger now, they're going to object to it. This is what he says as he's defending himself against people protesting and stuff, you know. He first he throws a dig at the football team and we, our football team was terrible. He throws a dig at us like, oh, you know, if they practice a little bit harder and stop worrying about this crap, they'd be a damn sight better. So that's the kind of shit he was saying at first. He literally says that in here. He says that to the cameras and reporters and everyone. He says that defiantly. I know enough about what's going on in the world to know there's a lot of people who, if you call them nigger now, they're going to object to it. That's what he said. That's what he said. And then he says, ah, where is that? He says, I come from, once again, tripling down. I was raised in a small town in Western Kentucky. There were 400 whites and 400 blacks. And we called them niggers and they didn't mind. This is someone who's on a board of trustees at a major university. At a major university. So they come in, like I said, myself and Christian Alt, we led this march. All of a sudden, the head coach says, once again, this goes back to the same thing about the same thing about neutralizing everything. Our head coach says, you know, I know it's, you know, it's regretful that he said it. I don't think he meant it. That's what our head coach says. I don't think he meant it. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Which time? When he said it during the Board of Trustees meeting? Or when he said it again at the uh, press conference? Or, or when he said it again at the press conference? Which, which, one, which one didn't he mean? Which one didn't he mean? And in a stunning, stunning level of white privilege, they interviewed... <laughs> We have Chris and I being interviewed for this. We're like, hey, we're not going to play for this team anymore, blah, blah, blah. Here's a, the line in the paper. Jay Dorch, a white player and Spring Drill's captain, said it was undecided whether all the players would join in or refuse to play. Jay Dorch, a white player and Spring Drill's captain, said it's undecided whether we'll – a white player – he co-ops this, they interview him. Now he's gonna decide what we're gonna do about it? I mean, like I said, it almost reads like a comedy now. It almost reads like a comedy. So what they do, a day or two later, they had that white guy and another guy on the team, unbeknownst to us, do a press conference with the coach accepting Happy Chandler's apology. He finally ended up apologizing. So the white player and this other black player, they go in there and they officially ended the boycott. Stunning. Absolutely stunning. What happened to Happy Chandler? Nothing. He was appointed to the board by our governor, Governor Wallace Wilkinson. And because he was appointed, the only person who could take him off was Governor Wilkinson. Governor Wilkinson wasn't going to take him off because he helped Governor Wilkinson get elected. Wilkinson was a dark horse, dark horse candidate who shouldn't have won, and, but he got pushed by Happy Chandler, and he ended up winning. So the net result of what happened to Chandler? Zero. Nothing. Nothing. He gets interviewed a year later for the Kentucky newspaper, 
and he says, <laughs> I know it's, it reads like a comedy. This is a year later. He's getting interviewed for again about all the stuff that happened. He says, I don't know what people are upset about. I said most Zimbabweans are niggers, and they are niggers. This is what he says. Like, like, what are these American black people getting mad about? I said most of the Zimbabweans are niggers now, and they are niggers. He's using the word over and over and over and over and over again. Remain on the board of trustees. Remain on the board of trustees. Unbelievable. So I leave. I finish up my last year. I win MVP for our team. I get drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I go into Pittsburgh thinking my coach is going to hate me. Because I just done, dealt with just years of unadulterated hatred for the past few years. So I'm thinking so I'm thinking that my look is just so distasteful now that every body of authority is going to dislike me. My first coach was Chuck Noll. Chuck Noll treated me like a king. They drafted me. I came in. We hit it off like chums. Got along with all my coaches. And it was a completely different mindset for me now. Now it's kind of like, now I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not tense anymore. I'm calm. I'm relaxed. And, you know, I'm playing in the NFL. I got coaches that like me. I have teammates. And, you know, we're good. Let me hop back for one second. One time I was in, in, in Kentucky. This is right before I left. I was going to visit my friend, Michelle. Michelle lives in this apartment off campus. Michelle and I have been, let's see, a friend for 35 years. I'm going over to visit her. I catch a ride with these white guys who are going to the same building. They're going to visit someone else, but they're going to the same building. We all get out of the car. We're walking into the building. I stop for a second, like, oh, you know, I forgot my whatever. I go back to the car for a second. They keep walking. I turn around. I follow right behind them. I'm probably 20 yards behind them. We get to Michelle's building. Michelle has a, um, uh, they have a concierge up front, a uh, doorman. My teammates just walk by and they go on in, the three white guys. I'm behind them. I'll come in. The guy goes, excuse me, might I help you? I said, oh, no, I'm good. I know where I'm going. He goes, no, no, no. May I help you? And I said, no, no I, I know where I'm going. He says, where are you going? I said, I know where I'm going. I don't need your help. Who are you going to visit? I said, why don't you ask them? He goes, who? I said, the three guys just walked in there. Why don't you ask them? Oh, because they live here. I said, they live here? He goes, yeah, yeah, they live here. I said, those three guys here live here. He goes, yeah, they live here. Which, of course, they didn't. They're my teammates. We all live in the same damn dorm. But once again, I was black. So immediately, I was a different guy. Remember that old Sesame Street song? One of these things is not like the other. One of these things just doesn't belong. That was me. I was that guy. Kermit the Frog is coming over there and tapping me on the shoulder. This guy doesn't belong. Out of the blue. So now him and I are in an argument. So once again, these are those, these are those levels, these, these little bouts of aggression and anger and arguments you get into that white guys don't have to deal with on a daily basis. So now I'm arguing with this guy who works at, a, at the, uh, uh, the front desk of my friend's apartment. He won't let me out. Now we're arguing. Michelle comes down. She brings me up. I'm so mad. I'm pissed off. Michelle goes, you know, says something to him, and I'm, you know, I'm just so mad. So on the way back down, I'm just young and stupid. <laughs> and Michelle and I always talk about this even 30 years later. They had a plant out there, and I was just so mad. I just took the plant, and I took it, and I just moved it, moved outside, took it outside. I, you know, you can't think of what to do, but you're so pissed you want to do something. So I took the plant, moved it. And you know what I did when I took that plant? I became the nigger he wanted me to be. I stole the plant. I didn't steal it. I mean, I just took it and put it, you know, moved it outside. 
I became that nigger he wanted me to be. So now you can say, see, that's why we didn't want them in here. They steal stuff. That's that fine line you have to walk. That's that fine line you have to walk. You're pissed, you want to do something, but whatever you do, you're gonna end up being what they want you to be. We go play in an all-star game, college all-star game down in Montgomery, Alabama. The uh, blue-gray game. So we're down there and they have this old guy working the game. He's kind of like a guy that's been around the game forever. And he's working the game. He's always just walking around, talking to everyone all day long. But we start to notice a pattern with this guy. First of all, he would never say blue team and gray team. He kept saying blue team and south team. Blue team and south. Blue team and south team. He kept doing that. It's like, well, it's exactly the blue gay games, not the blue team against the south. So he kept doing that. But there's another thing he did flawlessly every time. He would call all the white guys young men and call, call all the black players boys. He did it all week long. Hey, young man. Hey, boy. Hey, young man. Hey, boy. Hey. Every time. So every player there who wasn't a player from the South was pissed off. Like, hey, man, what the hell does this dude keep calling us boys all the time for? Now, it's okay if this old dude, and he calls everybody boys. There's a lot of old people that do that. You're, hey, boys, come on over here. You got... But he kept calling us boys, them young men. So we're all sort of seething. Now, all the black Southern guys were sort of a, a lot of times they're neutralized because, you know, I guess they deal with so much racism uh, where they're from that they learn is just sort of like, oh, he doesn't mean anything by it. So that's what they kept saying the whole time. Oh, no, come on, don't get mad. He, he, you know, he, he doesn't mean anything by it. He doesn't mean anything by it. I'm like, of course he means something by it. He keeps calling these guys young men. He keeps calling us boys. He keep doing it left and right. And we're down in Montgomery, Alabama. We're getting treated like shit the whole week. Restaurants, bars we go to, we just keep, keep, keep treated like dirt, you know? And uh, once again, it's, it's something that white people can't understand, but you go in there asking for this, oh, hey, you can't wear that in here. You can't, hey, what, what, do, you, what do you mean I can't wear this? There's five dudes over there with the same thing I have on. Uh, well, you know, uh, they, they, they came in before eight o'clock and that's, you know, just bullshit excuse after bullshit excuse. So this guy's boy and man, boy and young man, boy and young man the whole time. So we get on the elevator one time. We're on there, we're on there with a bunch of players. And by this time, like I said, I had really long hair. And there's a white guy named Jeff Logerman, went to University of Virginia. He has really long hair too. So we had we two long hair guys at this, at this football um, all-star game. So we're on, the, we're on the elevator and lo and behold, Elevator door opens, he walks on. So everyone's sort of pulling me behind like, hey man, hey, don't, don't do anything, don't do anything. I was like, hey, I'm cool, I'm cool, I'm cool. So we're on there, we're doing the normal elevator thing. Everyone's sort of just quiet and staring up. He looks over. Um, uh, you, 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 that, uh, you, 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 that, uh, uh, log, leg, 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 log, log, he said, uh, uh, logman. Yeah, yeah, logman. Yeah, you, 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 the young man from Virginia, right? I, I can tell by your hair. You, the young man from Virginia. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah I can tell by the hair. You, the young man from Virginia. He turns to me, I'm on the other side. I'm like, oh, here we go. Here we go. And like I said, the players are pulling me from behind, like, oh, don't do it. He turns to me and he says, uh, and, 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 and you, that boy from Kentucky, right? And I'm looking straight ahead, doing our elevator thing. I was like, oh, I'm from Kentucky, but I'm not your goddamn boy. And he goes, would you say to me, boy? Would you say to me, boy? I said, I am from Kentucky, but I'm not your goddamn boy. Son, I will have you thrown out of here quicker than blah, 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 blah. I was like, you're not gonna throw me out of here. I'll have you, I've been around this game for 50 years and I'll have you thrown out of here in a heartbeat. I was like, I'm an all-star player 
You think they're going to throw me out of this game for you? What, what are you thinking? What are you thinking with this white man mindset of they're going to throw me out of this game when all these NFL scouts are there to watch us? They're going to throw me out of the game because I don't like you? Ah, man. So I get called down later to the office or the little whatever they have set up at the hotel. Guy comes in there and he says, uh, you know, tell me what happened earlier. I was like, I don't know. I heard you got into it with whatever the guy's name is. I was like, no, I didn't get into it with him. I told him not to call me a boy. Oh, he, it's just a figure of speech. He doesn't mean anything by it. Once again, I was like, oh, why is it always the go-to excuse? Of course he means something by it. How can you flawlessly call this guy a young man every time and flawlessly call me boy every time? Every single time. Yes, he does mean something by it. And the guy's like, oh, you, you guys just stay apart. And you know, I was like, yeah, that's fine. I, I have no, no, no desire to talk to that guy at all. I'm, I'm fine. We go to a banquet the night before the game. Both teams, we all take a bus over there. Both teams go. They make us honorary citizens of Montgomery, Alabama, and they give us a little certificate, you know, like, here's a key to the city, you're honorary. So we get on the bus. We turn on the light. <laughs> We're reading the certificate, and it says, this is, da -da -da, has your name on it, the Kelly Tires, Blue Gray All-Star Game, honorary member of, uh, our honorary citizen of uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And then under it, it says, the cradle of the Confederacy. And there's a, uh, the, the backdrop of the certificate is a Confederate flag. You're giving us the black dudes. You're giving us the black dudes. A certificate that says honorary members, of, uh, honorary citizen of Montgomery, Alabama, cradle of the Confederacy with Confederate flag plastered against it. That's how much they think of us. That is, I mean, that, that sort of sums up the life of a black man right there. That they're gonna give you something honoring these slaveholders and these people that literally fought to keep you enslaved. They're gonna give you a, a certificate with that on there, bragging that they're the cradle of the Confederacy with the backdrop of the, of, the, of the certificate, the Confederate flag. I couldn't get out of that place fast enough. Couldn't get out fast enough. So jump forward, I'm now in the NFL. I'm thinking on my second year in Pittsburgh, uh, we would go to Orlando all the time. So now I'm gonna bring this back to the Trayvon Martin thing, why, why, it's so, why it's so sickening to someone like me and people like George Zimmerman that, that, that exist out there. So we would go to Orlando every year I had a friend that lived down there. So we'd go down there and hang out. We'd sort of make a trek through Florida. Go to uh, Orlando and we'd go to Miami and blah, blah, blah. It's just, you know, a couple players, we'd pop around. So we're at the Peabody Hotel and we're staying on concierge floors. So they have two concierge floors, which means you need a special key to get up to those floors. And in the morning and in the afternoons and in the evenings, they had like this little, this little food buffet thing set up out there, like a light, light meal, morning, afternoon, and night. And it's for people that stay on the concierge floor. I would say it's free food, but it's not because, you know, we're paying a hefty price. But, you know, having said that, so we get off the elevator. We walk off the elevator. We're walking towards the food. It's probably our, our second day there or something. A white guy pops out of his chair. Hey, 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 guys, uh, this, uh, this, this, this is for people that stay on this floor. We were a bunch of pretty significant sized dudes, and this dude was about here. We're like, just walk around. You know, I'm not even good to, I'm not even going to acknowledge you. He runs around and gets in front of us. Hey, 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 guys, and I, I'm not trying to be an asshole, but this is, this is for, this is for people that stay on this floor. This food is not just free. It's for people staying on the floor. It's either that or punch him in the damn mouth, right? So we walk around him again. 
he comes around again. Now he's putting his hands on us. Hey guys, hey, hey, I I'm really not trying to be a dick, man, but you know, we pay for this stuff. We pay for these rooms, we, you know, we, this, this stuff is not free. Are you guys thinking what I'm thinking? That it never occurred to him we might actually be staying on that floor? Did it ever occur to him we might be staying on that floor? So we walk around him again. He comes up, puts his hand on again. Then we gave him the warning, like, hey, you put your hand on us one more damn time, that's gonna be your ass. So we start eating. He goes downstairs and gets the manager. Manager comes up, sees us. The guy's pointing us out like, you know, like a little kid, like, hey, they're the ones that did it. The manager sees us, and he's like, oh, oh yeah, no, 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 they're, they're you know, he's, they're NFL players, they're NFL players, they're, they're okay. Because we're playing NFL, we're okay. They're like, no, they're, they're NFL players, they're okay, they're okay. They're okay. So then the little guy comes up again, he goes, oh, hey man, you know, my bad, I didn't know you guys were NFL players. It doesn't matter for NFL players. It matters that we're staying on this floor, which you still haven't acknowledged. So this was the kicker. The manager comes up and says, hey guys, you know, you guys cool, everything good? We're like, yeah, we're good. Just like I said, you know, you are lucky you came up here because he's probably gonna get punched in his mouth in another second or two. The manager turns and goes, oh yeah, no, no, it's cool. He's just, you know, he's, he's all right, he's all right. You know, you, you should have just told him you were staying here. You should have just told me you're staying here. That pissed us off like you wouldn't believe. You, you should have just let him know you're staying here. We turned to him and said, we don't have to let him know anything. He's just another guest like us. We don't have to answer to him. But that's how they processed it is. We have to answer to this guy. We have to answer to anyone that ever dares to, to question us. We have to answer them. And he said it like it was nothing. Oh, you should, you, should just, you should just let him know you're staying on this floor. We're like, did he ask anyone else up here? I mean, there's been 10 white people that have gotten off the elevator since we've been here. He's not once went over and asked anyone else. That guy did not work there. He was just a guy who was there. It would have been different if he worked at the hotel and he was checking everyone's keys. Once again, we had to have a special key to get up there. You can't just get up there. He wanted us to answer to that guy. So when I see this Trayvon Martin crap happening with uh, George Zimmerman, that could have been us. Because what if one of us punches him in the damn mouth and he pulls out a gun and shoots one of us? Now he's the victim. He's been accosting us, harassing us. Mad because we don't answer his questions. Now he has a right to fear for his life and he can kill us. So when I see that Trayvon Martin thing, I'm thinking, Oh man, I could have easily been us. Because if I'm walking home in the middle of the night, not doing anything, just walk to the neighborhood and someone stops and wants to question me and thinks I have to answer their questions, I'm not just gonna walk away peacefully. So, so when you see things like that, it just amazed me that all of a sudden, all these people took George Zimmerman's side for no reason other than this was a black kid. That's it. The guy didn't, the guy didn't do anything. By, by all accounts, he did nothing. But walking home, he got harassed by George Zimmerman, fought back, and then got shot. Then Geraldo Rivera comes on there and says, wow, his hoodie is just as much responsible for him getting killed as George Zimmerman. That's a quote from Geraldo Rivera and then seconded by Bill O'Reilly. Yeah, that hoodie. His hoodie was just as much of a reason for him getting killed than George Zimmerman. Think about that. Hey, Jewish guy, you wearing that yarmulke got you killed by some redneck, but you know what? Your yarmulke was just as, just as responsible as that as that uh, neo-Nazi. Can you imagine saying that to a white dude, to a Jewish guy? Like, 
what you had on caused you to get killed and that being a valid reason like it's valid that oh yeah yeah like yeah you shouldn't you shouldn't have had your shouldn't have had your keep on no yeah think about that but no one would think about that you just think about this black kid had a hoodie on therefore he deserved to die yeah he looked like a thug to me look like a thug to me so when we see that george zimmerman crap you know it scares us it scares us because we're grown men and to have someone harass you like that, of course we're going to fight back. And now he, has a, now he has a right to shoot us, even though he starts it. We're playing tennis. We're playing tennis in Pittsburgh. Four of us. By this time, I've probably been in Pittsburgh four or five years. We are Pittsburgh Steelers. Pittsburgh is a small city. If you play football for Pittsburgh and you're a starter on the team, People know who you are. We're playing tennis at a park, a local park. We've been playing for about probably 30 minutes or so. One of the guys we're playing with is a mega, 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 mega superstar. Mega superstar would eventually, you know, be in the Hall of Fame a few years later. Mega superstar. Everyone knows who this guy is. We're all playing tennis. This guy walks up. He says, hey, guys. You have to pay for these courts. We're like, oh, oh, it's a public park. We just thought, he's like, no, 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 the tennis courts have a, have a rental fee or whatever. You have to pay a fee, something like that. It's like, oh, that's odd. Once again, we weren't mad. It's just, this guy wasn't, he wasn't there when we got there. We just started playing. He came up 30 minutes later. So we weren't mad. It's like, oh, cool. Yeah, we didn't know. Sorry about that. He goes, yeah, so it's going to be, whatever. it's just a handful of dollars, five, six dollars, something like that with nothing. You know, it wasn't like the rental fee was $200 or something. He's like, uh, you know, yeah, so, you know, can you guys give me the money? We're like, hey, we're in the middle of this set. We got another couple of points left, and, uh, and then we'll get right with you. You know, we're all sweating and everything. He's like, uh, you know, I kind of need that money right now. But like, literally, we literally have like, you know, two more points left, and we're done. He calls the cops. He calls the cops. The police show up about three or four minutes later. You know, no telling what he said when he called them. Like, hey, four black guys have, you know, a hostile takeover of the tennis courts. You know, no telling what he said. But the cops got there like that. Perhaps they were around the corner. I don't know. So cop gets out of the car, realizes that we're, we're NFL players. There weren't too many non-athletes out in that area that we were in. Um, and the, the policeman comes up and, you know, he's like, hey, guys, you know, they said you guys were refusing to play, pay for the court. We're like, we're not refusing. We're literally in the middle of a game. He kind of made it seem like we walked up, he asked us for money, and we said no, and we started playing. He was not there when we got there. We're four NFL players. He called the cops on us for like $5. $5. Now imagine if this cop would have been a jackass. Luckily the cop was just nice and he knew who we were and you know, he came up and he's very pleasant and nice and we got it resolved. But what if he's one of those cops that comes off and shoots off the mouth real quick like, hey, get off the goddamn court, but you know, which happens all the time. You know, now we're talking serious business, maybe guns come out or who knows. Tennis courts in a public park, four professional athletes playing tennis with a court fee of five, six, seven dollars, called the cops. That's what we face every day. That's what we face every day. Called the cops. That's how we live. That's literally how we live. Everyone has their finger on that button, ready, you know, got that cop thing just ready to go. Everyone has a finger on the button. And nine times out of 10, we're going to be presumed guilty. We're just going to be presumed guilty. Happens all the time. But once again, it all stems from that lie of we're worse than, we can take more punishment than, 
we're more animalistic than it all just sort of trickles down and five centuries later it's still it's still present and of course these days it's being stoked even more so when you see these people on tv marching they're saying black lives matter and people get so offended by that term unlike anything that's ever been out there they get so offended by that term I mean, would it make it better if someone tacked on T-O-O -O at the end of it? Would that be more suitable? Black Lives Matter 2? But I've never, seen, I've never seen such a response. All lives matter. They haven't always mattered. They didn't matter during slavery. They didn't matter during the convict, convict leasing system. Didn't matter through... Jim Crow didn't matter through Reconstruction, didn't matter through the Civil Rights era. Just when exactly did these black lives start to matter so much that you guys can just encompass everything and say, all lives matter? Since when? That's why I wanted to speak to you today. When you see these people marching, you see these people are angry, and you see the other side of people going, oh, they must have done something. No, sometimes you completely have done nothing, nothing. One of my friends was driving my car home one night just because she wanted to drive. I don't drink, so I'm usually the driver. She wants to drive my car. We're driving home. Get pulled over. She makes a, she makes a zag turn. She thought she was turning left, realized it was one-way street, whipped back over. Good. She got pulled over. That's fine. She deserved to get pulled over. She did swerve. Guy walks up, asks her if she's been drinking. She says no. She said you swerved back there. Uh, yeah, I just, I thought it was a left, and I, I didn't know it was a one-way street, and I zigzagged. He quickly summed up that she wasn't drunk, just like that. She's driving. I'm in the passenger seat. We have a, a girl in the back seat. He says, whose car is this? Whose car is this? And she goes, his. And then he goes, this is your car? I said, yeah. He goes back there and runs the plates. He comes back. He goes, and what's your name? He knew who I was. He knew who I was because this, this is when I was still in Kentucky. I was so hated after that whole Happy Chandler thing with him, with the whole nigger thing. We became, we became the villains. I got so much hate mail. I had nooses sent to me on a daily basis. I had nooses. I had death threats. I had Confederate flags sent to me all the time. I mean, we went through some shit because this guy said nigger and we didn't want him on the board of trustees anymore. So all of a sudden we were public enemy number one. I regret not keeping all those nooses. I had small nooses, big nooses. They came in the mail, they were everywhere. Walking down the street, people spitting on me. <laughs> Happy Chandler's a real man. You're a fucking girl looking nigger. That's kind of shit we say all the time. He looks like a real man, you look like a fucking girl. Nooses. Sent nooses to us. Nooses, Confederate flags, all that shit. So this cop knew who I was. I had been harassed by the police so much by then after the whole Happy Chandler thing. I was getting harassed by the police so much, it was unbelievable. So he comes up to the car and says, you said this was your car? He goes, yeah. He says, what's your name? I gave him my name. He says, registration says it's not your car. I said, it's in my possession. He goes, but it's not your car. I said, yeah, yeah, it is my car right now. It's, just, it's in someone else's name right now, but yeah, it's my car. Now remember, I'm in the passenger seat. Get out of the car. I said, what? He goes, let me see your license. Get out of the car. So we're sort of, you know, we're in the city. We're sort of on a dark street. So I get out of the car. He turns me around, slams me against the car, starts frisking me and all that kind of shit. He goes, I said, what'd you frisk me for? He goes, because you let me. So once again, it's that thing of, if I fight back, then I'm that asshole who deserves to be killed. If I don't fight back, I just let you humili humiliate me for no apparent reason. That black man dilemma again. I'm legally right but deathly wrong. 
You know, it should have been my right to go, hey, man, get the hell out of my face, man. I'm, I'm, I'm in the passenger seat. I'm a sober guy in a passenger seat with a sober driver in the driver's seat. We've done completely nothing wrong. And now I'm the one out on the side of the road with this cop harassing me. Just like that. Just like that. Later on, my friend and I were riding through Beverly Hills. A few years back, cop pulls us over in Beverly Hills. Oh, I pulled you over because your, your windows were tinted too much. I'm in a convertible. Your windows were tinted too much. And they were sort of halfway down. It was at night. He had to really, 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 you know, be looking at us to see if, our, you know, the windows were tinted. All he saw was two black faces driving through Beverly Hills. He pulls us over and he goes, I pulled you over because your, your, your windows are tinted, but I see that your car is not registered here, so you're good. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, he goes. So where are you guys going? My friend and I are both in the car. We kind of just looked at him. And we just looked back straight ahead. He goes, where are you guys off to tonight? We kind of just looked at him again and looked back like, there was literally no reason for you to be asking us this. You didn't pull us over for a moving violation. You didn't pull us over because we broke any law. You pulled us over because our windows were tinted and you thought the car was registered in that state. So we don't say anything. I just roll up the window. We really didn't say another word, just roll up the window and drove off. So he follows us again, pulls us over again. Hey, I asked you a question. I said, you did. I'm not really obligated to answer that question. Of course, now he's pissed off. But literally, there's nothing he can do. He wanted to. You can see his mind working like, oh, damn it, what can I, what can I get these guys on? Luckily, neither of us drink. So we hadn't been drinking. We hadn't committed any laws. We haven't, we haven't broken any laws, I, I mean. But he wanted so bad to do something. Pull us over for completely no reason. A year later, I'm walking out of a movie theater, and maybe Janice is on here somewhere, I'm not sure. Uh, my friend Janice was working on a movie set. Her and I were gonna meet for dinner. I said, you know what, I'll drive to your area, I'll just catch a movie while you're still on the set, and uh, when you're finished, just give me a call, and we'll do dinner. So I drove to Sherman Oaks. I go to a movie. I go see this movie, Dark Water, with Jennifer Connelly. I'm, I'm sleepy and tired. I've been working out all day. So I go and I go sit out in the lobby for a minute where it's, where it's more light. And I see Bad News Bears is playing right there. So let me go in Bad News Bears because this other one's kind of slow and dreary and I'm trying to stay awake. I look in Bad News Bears, there's literally not one person in there. Literally, a completely empty um, uh, theater. I said, cool, I'll sit in here. That way, if I do fall asleep and start snoring, you know, it's not gonna bother anyone. So she calls me and she says, hey, I'm done. Just let me know when you're finished. I said, oh, I'm just, I'm just in here hanging out, waiting for you to get, you know, wait for you to get done. She goes, I'll be over there in about 10 minutes. Just call me when you're outside. So she calls me when she's outside. I walk out, I see all these police outside. So by this, by this time, I'm, I'm, I'm in my 40s. I'm like 42, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm dressed neatly, just, you know, we're about to go out to dinner. Um, I walk out and I see the police out there. I, I, I come through the door and they're like, get over, get over against the wall. So I'm thinking, oh, they're about to bring out someone behind me. They're trying to rush me over to the side. I'm like, oh, shit, shit, shit. And I get over and dude slams me against the wall. Pow! You know, I'm like, oh shit, what the hell? He starts patting me down. He's like, where are your friends? Where are your friends? It's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. No idea what you're talking about. Where are your friends? Where are they? I said, hey, what, 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 what are you doing? What am I being charged for? What, what's going on? He goes, you shut the fuck up. Where are your friends? Once again, I'm a grown man. So I'm like, okay, I got nothing to say. Because this is going to go downhill quickly. So I'm silent in treatment. Where are your fucking friends? Where are they? You know, he's got my face pressed against the wall. And uh, so he says, 
what movie did you go to? And I said, I was in Bad News Bears. He goes, where's your ticket? I said, well, I actually went to go see Dark Water. And then I went to Bad News Bears. Um, he goes, where's your ticket? I said, somewhere, you know, in one of my pockets. You don't know which pocket? I'm like, you're lucky I keep my stubs. You know, most people just throw their stubs away. This is why I keep my stubs. Just for random shit like this, you never know when as a black dude that you're gonna somehow get you know, harassed. So he's mad that I can't figure out which pocket my stub is in. So he reaches in my pocket, he finds a stub, you know, he grabs my license out. So by this time, Janice gets out of the car. She comes up, we're trying to figure out what's going on. So someone was stealing purses in there or someone had stole someone's purse or stealing purses. I'm not sure which one. So he thinks it's me and my buddies, you know, I'm there by myself. He thinks it's me. It's not me. So finally, the only thing that saved me is because Janice was there and she could sort of, you know, vouch that I was there by myself. Janice was a white woman. So Janice was there. And when I first pulled up, this is one of those smaller theaters where you can literally pull right up front if there's a parking space. And luckily I pulled up right up front and I have a sports car that's noticeable. And when I walked up to get the ticket, the guy was like, oh man, that's one of my favorite cars. I like that. And we talked about the car for a minute. I went in. So that kid who was probably like 17 or 18 years old, he comes running over there where the cops are and he goes, no, 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 no. He, he came by himself. He came by himself. The guy was like, hey, back up. He goes, no, he came by himself. We were talking about his car. That's his car right there. So they turn around and see my car out there. It has the top down. It's a convertible. It has the top down. It's sitting out there. And their, 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 their thing just changed immediately like, oh, oh, okay. You know, like maybe it wasn't you. But because they've already been an asshole to me, they had to keep it up. You can see that, that, that moment of reflection. And then it was like, hey, next time someone asks you something, you answer them. So now he's pissed off. You know, like he's pissed off because he was wrong and they were in the wrong. But now you still got to find a way. You still have to find a way to make me submissive. You know, like, hey, I could do this to you if I wanted to. And as I'm leaving, he goes, just remember, I can arrest your fucking ass right now for going to a different movie. Come on, man. Come on, come on. First of all, I went to a movies that were showing simultaneously. Not like I went to a movie, watched the whole movie, and then snuck into another. These movies were running simultaneously. I just got bored with one, went to the other, completely empty in the theater. So that's his threat. Once again, you gotta get that last thread in there and it's angry. And it's, even though you realize I haven't done shit, it's verified now that I haven't done shit, but you're still mad. How dare this black guy didn't bow down to me. Just pissed, you can just see it seething like, you, mm, mm, how dare you talk to me like that? That's me in my 40s, getting slammed against the wall and handcuffed because someone else, some black guy, they have stolen the purse. I'm that local black guy. I'm just that guy. I know you guys hear the stories on TV all the time. Guy gets pulled over, a guy says, oh, you know, we, there was a bank robbery down the street and the guy fits your description. What's your description? Black. You know, you don't need height. You know, the guy could be 6'8 and you could be 5'2. There's a black guy. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, got him. So that's all I saw. I was black. He didn't give me the common courtesy, anything. He just slammed me against the wall right away, started cussing me out. And now he's mad because I'm mad. That's it. So when people say,
There we go. No, it's like you use a computer out here. Here we go. Yeah, it's just for the server. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. We had a malfunction. Um, I will. All right. So I'll go ahead and wrap this up. You know, sorry for keeping you guys so long, but you know, trying to tell people about this stuff, it just really gets to you when you see it every day on TV and people still don't believe it happens. People still don't believe it exists. So that's why I wanted to talk tonight. And I hope somehow, if you guys have questions, feel free to, you know, Instagram me or, you know, whatever. Uh, we'll put this in case you guys couldn't see it. This is, this is, it's at my 40 formula. So feel free to, yeah. So feel free to uh, text me. You can see that yeah, at my 40 formula. All right. And uh, yeah, like I said, sorry for holding you guys so long, but I just want you guys to get the full scope of what it really feels like an everyday person. I know every time something happens, someone on TV, it's like, well, this guy has a criminal record. I mean, you see George Floyd getting choked out on TV for nine minutes. And you're still questioning what he did in the past. Well, you do know he got arrested for so-and-so. That's kind of how everything, that's how everything ends up shaking out. Everything ends up shaking out of, this guy must have done something. What did he do? Somehow he deserved it. So I'm just going to let you guys know a lot of times it's just nothing. A lot of times it's nothing. And you always get that same excuse. There's one thing I realized with our coaches, especially our college coaches, is where I, 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 I don't really like many college coaches, especially the self-righteous ones like Dabo Sweeney, those kind of guys at Clemson. I'll tell you why I don't like those guys. Because they're so self-righteous. He got in trouble a couple years ago for taking his players to church unauthorized. You know, you, you, you can't do that. You can't just force your team to go to church and do those religious things. So that's beside the point. The fact is, he was so self-righteous, he took these kids to church. So I'm kind of like forced him to do it. Always talking about, he likes to mold young men. You know, you know, these players come here and I mold them. I you know, turn them into men. I want them to be good citizens. I want them to be, you know, have good moral, you know, high moral standards and good men. What I came to realize, especially after playing in Kentucky, you mean, when you say high moral standards, I want you to be a good person. You mean the high moral standards of, or, or the morality of a white Southern man. That's what you're talking about. Me being, or your players being some tough guys who stand up for their rights. No, 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 no. No, I want you to be my kind of moral. No, I know you're fighting for equality and all that kind of stuff. So that, that's, that's why the Dabo Sweeney types annoy the crap out of me. So vocal wearing their religion on their sleeves, so vocal about morality and intensity and being a good man and being a good character. Quiet as a mouse when it comes to something with, you know, some kind of civil issue. Half your players are black. You stay completely silent. You're, 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 you're talking your ass off these other times. I want these men to be good leaders in their community. Oh, a good leader in terms of how a white man sees a black man should be a good leader, which is shut the hell up, don't argue back, and just take it. Or the whole, ah, they didn't really mean it, or just be the bigger guy. That's what they mean. They don't mean like, hey, fight, stand up and fight for your rights. If someone's screwing you over and you feel under, under assault all the time, you're a young black man in this country, you feel under assault, you go out there and fight for your rights. You never hear that enthusiasm for Sweeney or any of those coaches like that. Mike Leach, uh, Mississippi State, those kind of guys. Never, never hear it. 
So that's what they mean when they, you know, you hear these guys on TV talking about, you know, I want these, these people to come to my university. I'm going to mold them into good young men and their, their parents trust them with me. That's what you mean. How I see you or how I think you should be. Be quiet. Don't complain about the Confederate flag. Don't march because the black men are getting killed. Just, you know, you don't, just, you don't, you don't need to do that. That's why those coaches, those coaches annoy the hell out of me. And I'm glad these days that these players are starting to stand up and fight back. When we fought back 33 years ago, we got eviscerated. We got just simply eviscerated. I mean, it's lucky we made it through that year alive. We didn't have much solidarity. We had a handful of guys stand up. People in the southern towns were so scared. I'd actually get mail from black people in these little southern towns who were telling me to shut up because my actions were causing them pain down in those southern towns. Those white people in the southern towns couldn't get to me, so they took it out on those black people in those small southern towns. Once again, those are things you never think about. That never crossed my mind. I thought, oh man, every, every black person is gonna be with us. And I'm getting mail from these blacks in these small towns telling me to shut the hell up. Shut the hell up, shut the hell up. Kept getting those things, I was like, so black people saying this thing? I never considered what it was like for them to deal with that in their towns. Those people can't literally come up and lynch me, and they're gonna try, they can't come up and get me so they're going to take it out on the nearest black person they find in their town. Never crossed my mind. Never crossed my mind. We played the Cincinnati Bengals for the first time, my first year in the NFL. We played in Cincinnati. I had death threats on my phone in Cincinnati from the year before with the Happy Chandler thing. Cincinnati, for those who don't know, it's right by Kentucky. It's just, you just go, literally go right over a river, over a bridge. You're in Kentucky or you're in Ohio, Cincinnati or Northern Kentucky. So a lot of those people who are Cincinnati fans are also Kentucky fans. So that's how much hatred was still being shown towards me when we had to go play in Cincinnati. I was still getting th death threats a year later. So keep an open mind when people are out here protesting. You know, a lot of people can't verbalize what they're trying to say. And a lot of times, you won't get the intensity because it's on TV and because you know, there's certain language or certain actions you can't take on TV. To keep an open mind and to help the cause is first to acknowledge the cause. Acknowledge that, it, that it, that's there. I'm gonna leave you guys with this. Last year, maybe a year and a half ago, at Emory University in Atlanta. There are people that put eviction notices on some of the dorm rooms or some of the off-campus off apartments. And it was said to have been done by some Palestinian students to the Jewish students. I don't know the full four of the story. I don't. So that was them putting these mock eviction notices on the doors of a bunch of people. It turned into a huge uproar over here. Huge. They put mock eviction notices on these doors. And that was seen as a hate crime. It was seen as a threat. It instilled fear in these Jewish students. It might seem benign, but who am I to say what's benign and what's not? I can't tell someone else what they should fear and what they shouldn't. But after that incident, we're just talking about people putting eviction notices on people's doors. And not all Jewish students, they were just sort of doing it randomly. Um, there were signs everywhere around here. Every yard had a big sign that said, we support Jewish Emory students. Ever, you couldn't go two feet without seeing them. They were in every yard for blocks. 
for blocks. Nike made a shoe a couple years ago called the Black and Tan. They did it to honor the beer. They're gonna release it on St. Patrick's Day. It's called the Black and Tan. Irish people had such a reaction, they had to take it off the market. Black and Tan was the name of a paramilitary group that uh, a, a British paramilitary group that used to uh, abuse a lot of Irish people. They were sort of like the Gestapo, so to speak, from what I, from what I understand. So black and tan is so offensive to Irish people that Nike had to take that off the, uh, take that off the market and apologize. Reebok made a shoe called the Incubus. The Incubus is sort of a demon who does foul things to women. Took it off the market. That group of people was, 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 was offended by it, took it off the market. Irish people were offended by the black and tan shoe, took it off the market. Jewish students at, students at Emory felt an imminent threat by having these eviction notices posted on their door. We feel their pain and their sympathy, but someone puts Black Lives Matter up and you lose your fucking mind. All you see on videos all the time on TV is just, I mean, if you look on the internet, just people going around tearing down Black Lives Matter signs angrily, just, just ripping them down. Hey, you can't put that up here. Just losing their damn minds. So everyone is allowed to have their own pain, their fear, and their, their campaign. As soon as black people do it, you lose your minds. Black Lives Matter, T-O-O. -O. Really, would that make it better? All lives matter. Yeah, we wish all lives mattered. It sounds good, all lives matter. We wish all lives matter. That's why we have to distinguish that black lives matter because they've never mattered in the history of this country. Never. So that's what people are getting at. This is the shit that people live with every day. So a lot of you people out there, you have the luxury of not having to deal with that. Your kids have the luxury of not having to deal with that. You have the comfort of not having to deal with that. Your kids have the comfort of not having to deal with that. You have the privilege of not having to deal with that. Your kids have the privilege of not having to deal with that. That's what we're talking about. That's it. That's it. Thank you all for joining me. Like I said, feel free. Thank you, thank you back. Um, yeah, please feel free to, you know, keep on Instagram, Twitter, same thing. And uh, I really do appreciate you joining me. I uh, you know, hope you got a little better grasp of really what it feels like that every time something happens to someone, it's not some thug that people try to make him out to be. We feel our pain. We just want to acknowledge and have it dealt with. I thank you all once again. And for those of you who have children, I can give, a, like I said, a much, much more shorter, sanitized. Once again, far, sorry for keeping you so long to begin with. It's just, ugh. but, you know, those of you who have children, if you want to do something for children, it can be a lot lighter, of course, and uh, stories will be different, but sort of get the grasp. But thanks for joining me. Adios.